Hello, everyone. Welcome to session 45, part two of Libraries and Recovery, uh, originally as what is a library if the building is closed? That was the question that uh, presented itself when the pandemic was declared. Uh, and as a kind of reaction question, it becomes a kind of an existential question. What indeed is a library in general? And the fact that it's the building is closed uh, forces uh, a, a pretty deep re-examination of, of what that means. Uh, we've looked at various aspects. This is kind of how the whole thing started over, well, 45 sessions ago in March of last year, uh, looking at different aspects of that question like internet access, of course, uh, which has been most of our focus as gigabit libraries on uh, different ways that libraries are, are connecting and extending their, their connectivity out in their communities. Uh, and digital services, of course, which are extremely important and much more important in the pandemic. And then physical materials, which is not so much in our uh, wheelhouse, but obviously part of how libraries were initially reacting to the, to the pandemic. And then social infrastructure emerged as an obvious attribute of the question because it's clearly something that libraries represent uh, as a, uh, a major community asset. Uh, and, and it has just gone on from there. And we've explored a whole range of different kinds of topics. And, and uh, we've had over 100 speakers and approaching 5,000 registrations for the series. So uh, this has been really interesting. Uh, and it just continues to, to be so. And today will hopefully be another uh, interesting session because we have two, two more great speakers with us. Uh, we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. Uh, it's an open collaboration of, of uh, innovative libraries using technology in different ways. Uh, and our partner in crime for this series is uh, IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions uh, headquartered in The Hague. And at the helm recording the session today is Stephen Weiber, who's the head of, of public policy for IFLA. And Stephen and I have been working on uh, public access uh, policy questions for a number of years. And this has been a, a delight to work with Stephen and IFLA on this program. Our session sponsor is Kelly Clyde Warren, uh, who is a prominent DC law firm specializing in E-rate and other universal service programs. And they've been really helpful. Uh, last week was session 44, part one, State libraries, key to national recovery. I think we put a question mark on that, uh, uh, but I, we could put an exclamation on it because we think libraries are so central to communities and communities are central to national recovery. We had uh, Jen Nelson and Jenny Staff from Montana and New Jersey last week. And so this week it's part two of uh, state library agencies. And we have Janet McKinney and Mark Smith Jan is the director of library development for Maine Library, and Mark is the director of the Texas State Library. And so welcome to you both. Uh, this is a list of uh, funds that are relevant to, to libraries, and it's, a, it's an enormous pot of money. And we've been talking about these. We mostly focused on the, uh, uh, the emergency E-rate uh, connectivity fund there, the, the ECF, uh, just because that's mostly what we've dealt with in, in terms of connectivity. But connectivity is, while it's essential, it's insufficient, as uh, someone said. People need to be able to use that access. They can't do anything with the internet or with online services and materials without access, but just access is not enough. They need skills, they need support, and this is a key uh, function of libraries. But all of these are different paths, different uh, departments and so forth, but they're all relevant. And understanding what they are um, is, is an opportunity for libraries to take advantage of this enormous sums of money, which in our mind represents uh, a once in a generation moment for libraries to step forward in what they do and how they, how they serve their communities and how they help the communities understand what they do, which is something that we think needs more attention. 
Uh, before we get to the program, we'll do our COVID report, which has uh, kind of become a, a regular force. This is, of course, the context for this, for this whole series. So vaccines, they're wonderful, miraculous in, in such a short amount of time. They're really good. The variants maybe not so good. We really don't know. But maybe they're not that bad because, well, we just haven't seen that the, that the vaccines are not uh, effective against the variants. But you do need to be vaccinated at least for now. We don't know how long it's gonna last. There's, you know, the point here is there's a lot of unknowns. We may feel like we're you know, on the far side of this, coming out of this uh, pandemic, but uh, we would counsel patients on that. The, the jury is still not in. Uh, this is a substantial uh, accomplishment by the, just in the last few months to go from you know, uh, a half a million doses a day to over 3 million doses a day. And now we're tapering off, which is a whole nother conversation about who wants and who doesn't want to be vaccinated. <laughs> we'll also leave that one for now. Uh, the case count for uh, the U.S. is kind of uh, ambling along there at about 50,000. It's down. It looks like it's dropping again. That's good news. And we would expect that to be the case. However, we're not alone in the world in this global pandemic. And there are other places. And India is, of course, in the news right now as dire, as really an awful situation. They're completely overwhelmed. Their health system is, is, is overwhelmed, swamped, and they're just turning people away. Uh, they, they can't keep up with all the deaths and the bodies. It's just horrible. Uh, um, what makes that even worse is that I, there's a the I, I like, manufacturing uh, center for for uh, vaccines and a lot of countries have been depending on India to ship vaccines to, and India is now holding on to those. Did I ask uh, Sean um, to mute? Sean, could you mute, please? Yeah, we didn't, no. we didn't talk. I thought... And uh, so the point being that... Uh, uh, oh, and this is the other part here is that these vast numbers that we're seeing from, uh, from India are undercounted, way undercounted, two to five times uh, below what uh, is uh, believed to be the real numbers. That's astonishing. That's, that's something like maybe 10,000 or more people are dying every day in India from uh, this resurgence. They thought they had it under control, but they didn't. They just all came out. Uh, it's a really fascinating and horrible kind of story. And, and this quote from Larry Brilliant, which is a world leading epidemiologist who was instrumental in actually eliminating smallpox. The last cases were eliminated in India, as a matter of fact. And Larry is pointing out that we're not safe. We're not over this until we're all have it under control because uh, the, the more cases are out there, the more mutations and the greater risk that uh, vaccines or even antibodies from having uh, having COVID are less effective. And so we have to really keep focused on it. And I think this translates into our own personal policy, our own uh, facilities and our own, com own communities and how we kind of keep watch on what's happening and, and stay cautious and careful. And I hope everybody is getting vaccinated, by the way. It's, uh, it's really time for that. Um, so here we are today with uh, Janet and Mark. This is gonna be uh, a lot of fun. Uh, we're, we're pleased to have you both, and we're going to ask Janet to, uh, to take us out here, and I will stop sharing, and I will melt, welcome Janet McKinney from the great state of Maine. Janet, welcome. Tell us what's going on up there. Well, thanks a lot, and um, we played around with my screen, and so I have to do my PowerPoint this way, so um, it's good to see you all. And um, when Don asked, asked me to talk about what we're doing in uh, Maine with our ARPA funds, um, uh, one of the things that we've been talking about is extending broadband into rural Maine. So I'm just going to quickly go over um, the kind of landscape in Maine so that you understand. Um, we have to the 2.294 million uh, from IMLS 
Um, our population is a little over 1.3 million. We have 16 counties. We have 721 cities and towns, but only 256 libraries that are servicing or are not servicing those 721 uh, cities and towns. Um, you can see with our population in libraries that um, the majority of our libraries are serving populations under 5,000. And we only have six libraries serving populations over 25,000. Um, our largest city is Portland, Maine with only 66,000 people. And our smallest library uh, population served in Maine is Frenchboro. That's an island off, uh, off the coast of Maine with a whopping population of 59. So that kind of gives you an idea so we have three large statewide initiatives that we're going forward with. Um, uh, one of our biggest ones is called Bendable Maine, and it's a lifelong learning platform that we're beginning to build and using some ARPA funds to go forward with that. This has been an initiative. Um, it's based on what um, South Bend, Indiana did. And we have been talking with our Department of Labor for a really long time. So offer gives us an opportunity to really move forward with it. We are doing formula subgrants to Maine public libraries. Um, it's the first time we're doing subgrants in Maine. So that's really scary. <laughs> um, we have another large initiative that will bring rural libraries into our statewide catalog. Currently, we only have um, just over 50 of those 256 libraries that are part of a system that actually can, can show their collection and uh, patron initiated ILL through our statewide catalog called MainCat. So this initiative will bring at least 50 to 100 um, more into that. We're doing two field testing projects and um, one of the ones that Dawn wanted me to talk about most is something that, you know, we have been talking about in Maine is creating library annexes or kiosks out into the community. So that's what I'm going to emphasize today. But we're also um, putting some ARPA funds into telehealth. Janet, before you yeah. go to the next slide, could you go back one? Sure. Uh, uh, we've had the bendable people on that present this uh, lifelong learning platform. Yeah. It's really fascinating. Could you tell us more about how that, how that works and how it's working already or where are you in that? We're literally just in the signing, signing the papers and the contract, but uh, basically uh, bendable is really around a community focus. And so in South Bend, it's just around the community, but it's, through the uh, library system. So there in South Bend, it's the St. Joseph's Regional Library System, I think. I talked to the Bendable people and then um, the Department of Labor had talked to them and we had been talking with the Department of Labor. And so we actually, you know, have been collaborating and talking about, you know, can Bendable work at a statewide level? And in looking at Maine and thinking that people think of themselves as Mainers, our attempt will be to bring uh, the Drucker Institute who um, manages Bendable into Maine and you know, dive deep into the planning stages, which is what this original 600,000 will do. So the, the platform can be you know, statewide or it can be hyper-local. And so we're really excited to be able to um, utilize Bendable to bring in different content that matches the needs throughout the state. And that was the really um, fascinating thing about the approach is that normally a state will contract with, um, you know, all you, you know, your EBSCOs and your Gales and then anybody else like your LinkedIn learning or your Udemy's or whatever. Um, what Bendable does is, is they assess needs and they start building the content and then they build pathways to content. And some of those pathways are totally free. 
some of those pathways are to things like a uh, local organic gardener, you know, doing, you know, you want to learn how to do organic gardening, fine. But then some of them are based in, you know, local like healthcare systems or whatever, and what kind of training they anticipate people need in coming to applying for jobs. And so it's this very wide swath. So the ability to bring them in and to do that analysis statewide and to really build something that meets the needs of both um, unemployed, underemployed, and people who just want to change jobs and all the employers and what their needs are was the thing that drew us to Bendable. And did Bendable come to the library or did it, is there another state agency that was the focal point? No, no, it was, um, I actually, in fact, uh, I think it was when I saw Bendable here at when, when you hosted them, um, it, it re-triggered our conversation with the Department of Labor because it just had been up and down. And when COVID started and, you know, unemployment went crazy, the Department of Labor, you know, totally lost focus and we lost focus too. Um, and so I began a conversation with the presenter um, of Bendable and ended up talking to uh, Rick from Bendable who had some main connections. So the state library initiated with it and we've had like two or three stakeholder meetings with the Department of Labor, DECD, the university, adult ed, um, some people from the governor's economic commission. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we were able to bring everybody to the table and get them excited uh, because we're tired of competing with alternative platforms all over the place. And we figure Maine's population is small enough that we can do this together. Uh, it's outstanding. And I, I, I didn't mean to belabor this particular point, but in fact, oh, yeah. it, is, it is really fascinating. Uh, we've been talking about lifelong learning since I don't know when, but how to actually do it and what does that actually mean is is another matter altogether. But the in South Bend, where I think they developed this, uh, they approached the mayor originally about yeah. you know, taking responsibility. And, and he said, well, this is a great idea, but it's a bad idea for the city to own it because we're, you know, we're subject to massive budget fluctuations and politics. The place that needs to own this is the library. And so he referred them to the county library there and it is the natural home for this. It's just exactly the right, uh, right place to take on this responsibility. So we're kind of fired up about the idea that this yet another role for libraries, uh, but in their you know, capacity as educational institutions and serving everybody, it just seems like a, a, a really interesting thing. So we're gonna be following your story there and, and, and we'll ask you to come back and tell us how it goes. So sorry for yeah. the interruption. I just wanted to kind of focus on that. I think it's interesting, please. Go yeah, ahead. no, um, you know, thanks. I, I, I've been very excited to, to talk about it and didn't want to focus too much on it uh, during, during this talk, but- um, My fault, you know, thank you. Yeah, so um, as far as the library and, and kiosks go, um, you know, we, we do have challenges. Maine's a rural state. Um, the, we are so lucky um, to, to have what we have in Maine as far as connectivity with our libraries, but our, we want to be able to extend the Maine library's connections deeper into the com communities and utilizing a library annex or kiosk um, at another location in the community. And, but we also, as you saw from the statistics before, we have many, many communities that don't have a library. So we have a lot of people who are underserved by libraries. And so looking to this model of a library annex or kiosk as a way to bring library services to places that currently don't. We have a small books by mail program with individual citizens and communities that are underserved, but we're nowhere scratching the surface of, of, of meeting uh, needs in those communities. So um, what we wanted to do was to 
kind of field test this rather than to do some big rollout because we don't know what we don't know yet. <laughs> so figuring out through these field test projects what the building and implementation costs and what installations work where and how so that we can use, um, use this as a model to really do a larger rollout in Maine. And, um, you know, we, we are lucky, I referred uh, to the, uh, broadband. Our libraries are part of the Maine School and Library Network. And this has been around since 2000, let's see, oh, the early 2000s um, with a, a rate case. And we started this great Maine School and, and Library Network. But um, so all but a handful of the island libraries will have a minimum of a gigabit fiber connection starting July 1. And so that's super exciting. Um, but the schools and libraries have robust connections, but those robust connections haven't filtered out into the community, even though the service providers are bringing the fiber, high-speed fiber into the schools and into the libraries, into these communities. It's actually the people living, you know, outside on the edges of town, you know, dirt roads, there's no cable access, you're trying satellite, you're, they're, they're trying always to try to get, you know, a decent internet connection. So, you know, the library might not reach to those people, but will at, le at least hopefully be able to extend the signal further out so more people can uh, can access and in different places in town where they don't actually have to go into the library building. So, you know, we're excited about, you know, public libraries broadcasting their, their Wi-Fi out. Um, we do have challenges in Maine because our statewide network is funded by the E-rate program by about 70%. And the balance is funded by a main uh, telecommunications education access fund, which is kind of like a state E-rate. So on people's telephone bills, they see the big E-rate number. And then they see, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's 21 cents or 25 cents on the monthly phone bills that go into the state fund. Um, so current... Currently, the E-rate rules only allow a library to extend their Wi-Fi um, on the library property. And um, so both of our uh, initiatives depend on that library's connection and being able to do that legally under, under E-rate rules. So we've worked with the Maine School and Library Network and if we can set up what can be legitimately defined as a library annex or kiosk, they can bring the connection to that and that's within the E-rate rules. But as we all know, um, the, uh, let me get to my next slide here. That, um, you know, we also have the emergency connectivity fund and that will reimburse 100% of costs. And so will there still be funding around for us to do a wider rollout? Will the rules of the road allow us to leverage the emergency connectivity fund money with our IMLS money? And then the big question is FCC and the cost allocation requirement and that idea of if a library extends its signal beyond um, its property, they have to do that cost allocation and somebody else has to pay for it. So we're eagerly awaiting what the FCC says and something might come out today, I think I heard yesterday at COSLA. So, um, you know, I think everybody has heard about the Emergency Connectivity Fund and, um, you know, what's allowable there, you know, the kiosks, you know, mobile Wi-Fi. So, you know, all of what we plan for this particular, you know, library annex and kiosk thing fits also into the emergency connectivity fund. And um, there is also this opportunity for um, laptops and tablets and things like that, which I'm hoping our, our libraries in Maine will be able to make use of. 
so we do have some dreams, you know, it's what's going to work in Maine and what are weather impl implications in Maine for any kind of outdoor kiosks or annexes and, and how, how broad can they be? Will it just be a hotspot service? Will it just be an all e-service? So our download library, you can get Wi-Fi, you can download a book. Or will we actually have something bigger and larger that there are actually books involved? And um, you know, with Dawn's inspiration and 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 talking about this, I found this really cool thing from uh, called the Story Pod from Tor Toronto. And I've actually talked to the architect architects about this and where the pl the plans are. You know, it's probably not realistic to have this be something that's available in Maine during winter time because it's a little foldable cube, you know. But I was so intrigued by the idea of a remote location um, in, uh, in different areas of Maine. And then looking at something like this hold it uh, thing for maybe installation outside or inside a town hall in a town that doesn't have library services. And can we bring van delivery and books to there and can, you know, through the kiosk mode, can people request books from um, the catalog? So, um, you know, these were some of my inspirations as we were talking about this. And, you know, one of the things that I'm really thinking about, um, I found this picture of something, I think this is in Germany, you know, which looks like an old telephone booth that's been retrofitted. But here on the left, this is Lincolnville, Maine. And this is where the ferry comes in, going out to the island of Islesford. And um, this is a parking lot. The library is four and a half miles away. And so the library and where it is, is not where the hustle and bustle of where the ferry is located. So this is a perfect spot for a library sponsored Wi-Fi, a place where people could download an ebook and get on the ferry and go over to Islesford. Um, so um, ha I have more questions than answers. And, you know, um, this is, I don't see it as too, too risky, but it's a way for us to delve in and to figure out the most effective way to do this in Maine. And, you know, the big thing is, is that we just want to extend library services to more rural communities and that these services should include Wi-Fi to that new location. So we're waiting to see what the FCC um, says. So that's it. That's great. Uh, it your uh, your images there uh, of those kiosks, they, you know, from what you were describing, it sound like they could be kind of proto libraries, you know, it's yeah. kind of the beginning of a, of a branch, uh, micro branch. I mean, there's all kinds of terms and ways to think about this, but it sure seems like the language, the tentative language for the uh, emergency E-rate connectivity fund is absolutely going to uh, allow this kind of extension. It seems to be the very purpose of it. I mean, it originated with the, the primary purpose to how do we connect 15 million K-12 students at home who don't have access otherwise, and 55 million, however many there are. <laughs> and of course, libraries are included with schools under, under E-rate and have also been extending mostly with hotspots. Check out hotspots have been the default setting. It's just it's kind of simple, you know, you handle it as a physical material, you already know how to do that, and it gives people connectivity. It just gives a limited number of people connectivity, and, and they typically have to turn it back in at some point, and it's also an ongoing expense. It's great to the, to the extent that, that enough people can use it. So our position on this has been, that's fine as much as you can afford, but also don't overlook the fact that a common point of access is valuable as an interim, as a fallback resource. Uh, and the, the idea of, of a public space where a library has a presence is, is so economical compared to any other kind of uh, uh, solution to this. And it also creates an opportunity to partner with the schools to 
kind of figure out where are places that could support students. If they can't give every student one of these, they need to give some kind of an answer to them. And where could they go? Some kind of a homework hotspot location. A community center might be another place that would, yep. that would work and, and give you uh, protection from the, from the weather. Uh, but, but that's fascinating. We have, of course, uh, in Maine, we, uh, we were able to provide an award to uh, a Maine library in Millinocket to do the very thing that uh, Janet was describing. They were using TV white space to extend the signal to uh, a few places around the community. Uh, it's a, a fascinating story of a town that, that uh, had principally their, their economic base was a paper mill and it closed and they said, well, we were a one horse town where the horse died yeah. and the population went from 8,000 to 4,000 almost overnight. And the people, and they closed the library immediately. And the people in Millinock had said, well, no, this is a bad idea. Well, we're not gonna roll over, we're gonna recover, we're gonna get busy. And so they, they hired a librarian from Syracuse and then he reopened this library and ran it with, I think, several dozen volunteers yep. six days a week so yep. it was a great story and and we gave them award to locate these remote stations like Janet was describing and in, in you know recreational areas around town they their their economic recovery had a major tourism component on it and we saw the application go tourism what's that about you know how does that really relate to libraries and education well it relates because that's the community priority and the, and the library does serve what the community priorities are. And, and so it helps there. They're, they're at the very northern end of the Appalachian Trail. Beautiful town, Millinocket. And Maine is beautiful. Janet, you guys, I know you have cold winters, but man, is it beautiful. <laughs> I, I, the, an update to Millinocket, they have actually opened a branch and that branch lends snowshoes, skis, bikes, and all the equipment to help in the with the recreation in the area, and um, it's it's a wonderful success story. It, it is. It's the busiest little town I've ever been in. Yeah. I mean, everybody was. So I, I've only got fifteen minutes. You know, I'm gonna, and you can get anywhere in town in five minutes. But it was it was really impressive. Everybody was on the move there, and and it's just it's heartwarming to see people, you know, deal with adversity and rally around uh, communities and, and their library is, you know, is a focal point for that. Um, so that's great, Janet. I think you should be really uh, aggressive with this uh, ECF, preparing to go for the gold. This is, this is a, a big pot of money. It's gonna cover a lot, of, a lot of different kinds of things. The very minimum thing you can do with this, it seems like to me, is take one of these checkout hotspots and use it as a fixed location. You know, why why not of course you need to have coverage but if you yeah can do you know we have a real challenge using hotspots in maine because we don't have because of our geography and how the service providers work we have some libraries if they do a hotspot program they have to use three different service providers to be able oh. to guarantee that it'll work in the towns and so hotspots are not a good solution so no. even though the schools gave hotspots to those students that didn't have access. The Department of Ed had to contract with four different service providers to make sure that the student could get a signal at home. Mm -hmm. So that idea of you contract with T-Mobile or Verizon and you get coverage across the entire state, that does not work in Maine. So that's why we're looking for this solution. The, the flip side of that, that uh, unfortunate circumstance is that uh, you have lots of available spectrum, open public spectrum to use, like TV white space and five gigahertz and these kinds of things to build, you know, DIY is kind of the solution, but it's the challenge to take that path. But you have a wide open field up there yeah. uh, to create things like that. And it's happening all over the place. Uh, and another reason to partner with schools is they tend to have good IT uh, capabilities and make you know, and, and so supporting students, uh, working with libraries to, to find ways to connect and support students is a natural partnership. We're really encouraging those. Uh, this is great, Janet. We're really going to look forward to having you back and getting an update, uh, you know, after these grants uh, start to unfold and we get a clearer picture of it. So now we are going to turn south. We've been in the northern part of the U.S., 
And now we're heading down south, south, southwest to Texas, my home state, by the way. Uh, not today, but then. And uh, so last week we had an interesting combination of states. We had New Jersey and Montana, east and west, really different environments. And today also we have an interesting uh, combination of, of, of Maine and, and the great state of Texas, which is gaining more uh, congressional seats as I read in the news today. Congratulations on that, Mark. Welcome to us, hook em horns. Uh, and uh, uh, we talk about access a lot, and Janet did uh, give us a good story on extending access. Uh, but as we made the comment in the beginning of the session, access is essential, but it's insufficient. People need to know how to be able to use this stuff uh, to really be uh, involved and, and capable of taking advantage of the, of the the, the wonders of the internet. We'll leave the uh, dangers aside for the moment. We'll get back to them, but we'll leave them aside for the moment. But Mark, tell us, you know, how you're how you're dealing with inclusion and and, and you know, it's a, it's a huge state. You must have every kind of circumstance to deal with up there. So, welcome for the first time, and and uh, let us know. Tell us what's happening. Well, thank you, Don. I appreciate that, and I, I really enjoyed uh, listening to Janet's um, uh, comments, and I got. I got a number of great ideas, and um, and actually in the in the middle, uh, I, I I really hadn't been familiar with that bendable uh, product before. Uh, so actually in the middle of the of the of the flow, I, I shot a direct message to to uh, our E rate and technology consult consultant Henry Stokes, who's on this um, this meeting as well, and I said, hey Henry, you think we should look into this bendable with some of our ARPA funds? And he said, sure, why not? Let's let's take a look at it. So. You know, we try to be as nimble as we can to, to 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 take in these great ideas and these idea sharing things are always so important and appreciate you including me this time and my apologies to the group for not having powerpoint slides i just couldn't get it together for today so i'm sorry you just have to listen to me talk that, that's on me mark i only you know gave you an invitation on monday i think so oh, that's all right. <laughs> That's how Texas, the Texas legislature, and I'll, I'll mention a couple of things about this later. But the Texas legislature is meeting right now, and it's it, it is they're in the the final uh, short hair days of this thing, and and so it's a uh, it's sucking up all of our time. So I, my apologies to the group for not having pretty slides, but maybe next time I'll do that. But what I thought I would do is just um, tell the group a little bit about. Uh, who we are in Texas, what our digital inclusion activities have been, why, you know, where we've come from historically with that, why they are central to our agency's kind of DNA and why, why it's been part of what we do for a long time and, you know, kind of where we are right at this moment and what our plans for the future are. And, and I'll talk about our ARPA funds as I, as I go along a, a little bit about that. So just a, a, a word about who we are, uh, Texas State Library and Archives Commission, we are an independent agency of state government. You know, all state libraries are different. Some are independent, some are part of other organizations. We happen to be an independent agency. Uh, we have existed in one way or another since the early days of the Republic of Texas. So going back to 1842 was the first time that the state actually um, appropriated funds for a library and archive. Um, we are, Larger than most state age, um, state library agencies, uh, we have 170 authorized FTEs and an annual budget of about $34 million. Uh, we have robust archives and records programs. We also manage our statewide talking book program. Uh, and of course, uh, our library development and networking division is responsible for uh, promulgating services for libraries across the state. Uh, we are totally multi-type in our approach, although we still, like most state library agencies, we tend to be more heavily geared towards publics, but we also serve um, academic and K-12 libraries as well. Uh, we have about 500, well, a little over 500 public libraries, uh, accredited public libraries in Texas, about 200 uh, university libraries, and an, a literally an unknown number of school libraries. Uh, that not, the 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 number of school libraries is actually not a, a data element collected by our state education agency. So we know that there's about 1800 districts in the state of Texas, and we've got about 1000 districts that participate in our um, e shared e resources. So, um, so that so we serve a lot of school libraries as well. 
We are uh, governed by a seven member uh, commission that's appointed by the governor. Uh, so how important is uh, digital um, inclusion and access to our agency? It's extremely important. Um, for several years, our commission has formally adopted an operational goal uh, to uh, pursue digital inclusion for the people of Texas. Uh, we see that as very central to our role. In fact, one of the most important things that we do. Um, and, and literally the number one budget um, focus uh, of our agency. Um, long before this was even a formally stated strategic objective of our agency, uh, the state libraries operated programs intended to bridge the digital divide. Uh, going back to the, to the 1990s, uh, we were one of the first agencies in state government to really actively push, try to push internet out to communities uh, across the state of Texas. Starting in 1997, uh, we became the cognizant agency for a project known as TechShare, which is our shared uh, database services for, for libraries. That started in 97 as a higher education project for, for um, uh, college and university libraries in the state. And, and in 1999, um, uh, public libraries were added to that as well. A few years later, we also added a complementary program for K-12 uh, libraries across the state. Um, so we, we purchased statewide access to, to shared e-resources for the state. And it is, that is the number one um, budget item uh, up in our budget of that 34 million I mentioned a little while ago, uh, well over 15 million of that is, uh, are these shared database products for the state of Texas. Um, starting in the 2000s and then going into the 2010s, we began to work more heavily in the area of broadband for libraries, especially public libraries. Uh, initially, that work consisted primarily of providing support for libraries accessing E-rate discount. And I mentioned Henry Stokes on our, st on our staff who's on this call. Henry is our E-rate um, consultant for the state of Texas and has done a, a lot of a fantastic work bringing E-rate uh, to libraries in Texas. Um, but in 2017, uh, the Texas legislature appropriated a million dollars to help us actively reach out and bring high-speed internet to, to more libraries in Texas. Uh, the program we la launched with those funds is called Libraries Connecting Texas. Uh, we used those funds to, one, hire a partner to help libraries apply for E-rate, and, and two, as an incentive in, for the first couple of years of that project, we paid for their non-E-rate discounted portion of their, of their telecom. Um, consequently, um, we've, we've had a, a lot of success with that program. Uh, I, like to, I like to say that it's the best $1 million that the uh, Texas legislature ever spent. Um, before the start of that program, uh, we had about 6% of our libraries that met the FCC standard for connectivity for, for libraries. Uh, now, I believe that number is around 30%. Henry, come correct me if I'm wrong about that. Before we started the program, only about 24% of Texas public libraries received E-rate uh, discounts. Uh, now that number is, is, is up around 35%. Um, on average, we've increased internet speeds uh, for the libraries that participated in that project by over 1,050% on average. And possibly one of the most important things about that project is that we have gained some really important information about the lay of the land in terms of how internet is deployed and how high-speed broadband is deployed in the state of Texas. Um, and um, the best news about that is we did all of that over four years and we actually still have a little dab of that money left that we have not spent. So it, uh, it has lasted us in the, in the frugal way of librarians, that money has lasted us uh, going on five years, although we will spend the remainder of those funds this year. Um, while that has been some progress, uh, we recognize that we've got a long way to go to catch up with Maine and other states where they're, they're, they're hitting you know, much higher levels of E-rate participation and, and, and connectivity. Uh, for one thing, uh, we've learned that it is very costly to bring last mile service to small community libraries. Uh, you mentioned the diversity in Texas. We've got several of the largest cities in the country. We also have, we also have hundreds of small community libraries in rural settings across the state of Texas. And it's, it's very uh, hard to balance um, th their needs with the, with the urban needs. But um, we um, have launched a number of programs to try to 
uh, bring more connectivity and broadband uh, inclusion, digital inclusion to those um, libraries. Uh, we've also found that it is really important uh, to look at their equipment because it doesn't do any good to run um, a 50 meg or a, a one gigabit connection to a library if their if their equipment was was uh, made for T1 speeds. So it it just um, uh, we realize we've got a, a real uh, steep uh, climb there as well. Um, this past year, using funds that came to us first through the U.S. CARES Act. Uh, we took a step towards addressing last mile issues by implementing a pilot program with a partner known as the Lone Star Education and Research Network, or LEARN. LEARN is a nonprofit member-based organization that provides high-speed internet connectivity, uh, mostly to higher education across the state of Texas. Uh, they are our Internet2 community anchor partner for Texas. Uh, until now, they had not included libraries. Um, they had mostly included only higher education institutions, but using a million dollars from our CARES uh, funds, we completed a pilot program to bring 10 small community libraries into that LEARN network. Now, that's a lot of money per library, especially when you compare it to what we spent in the Libraries Connecting Texas project where we brought, where we brought 160 libraries, E-rate um, and high-speed broadband um, with a million dollars here, we're bringing 10 with a million dollars, but, but remember these are the smallest, most rural, most isolated libraries and getting to them has proved very costly. Um, but what we have at the end of that process is that we do have the connection that goes not only to the library, but to the community. And we also have uh, taken off the table most of the um, upfront costs of making that connection happen so that what the library is responsible for going forward is a is a very low and e-rateable amount going forward so it's a stable long-term connection that connects them to our community anchor partner for the state of texas so um, that that's valuable in itself and so we're real happy about that although we wish we could do it uh, less expensively so that brings me to our plans for moving forward and what we've um, what we're going to do with our ARPA funds. We will be receiving about eight point four million dollars from the America Rescue uh, Plan Act. Uh, the funds are, as everybody knows, designated for COVID recovery and digital inclusion. We are definitely focusing much more heavily on digital inclusion with these funds. Um, first of all, we're, des we're designating two point five million for a next phase of the Learn Project or something similar to that to try to bring last mile connections to, to local small community libraries. We're also exploring the possibility of a statewide 470 to try to um, both assess the availability of, uh, of service across the state, but also provide a platform to, for planning uh, for how we can support libraries to take more advantage of E-rate. We'd love, we'd love to be 70% E-rate participating in Texas like Maine is. Um, we are um, interested in um, looking into CBRS and anything else that would help to promulgate a, um, uh, um, uh, an internet signal, uh, Wi-Fi signal out to surrounding areas. The TV white space is, is, is obviously another uh, possibility. Uh, we are uh, designating uh, about a million dollars for a digital navigator program to train and assist librarians to be more accomplished and effective um, pr providers of digital access services in their communities. Uh, that is a, a kind of an extension in a way of a, of a project that was started a couple of years ago called the Tech Technology Academy, where we worked with specific libraries providing hands-on training to do digital projects and providing them grants to make uh, those projects happen. You know, Cindy Fisher on our staff, our digital inclusion uh, on librarian consultant, um, that was Cindy's project, and it's it's made a huge difference in terms of bridging that get, that skills gap. Uh, we're designating about three hundred thousand in funding for a digital equity summit to try to bring library stakeholders together to start planning the future of connectivity in Texas, uh, and we are modeling that on the good work that our um, our colleague Lauren Moore, the state librarian in New York, has done recently. Uh, we're real intrigued by by that um, her work there. And finally, we're probably going to use about 1.75 million of our funds to enhance access to online resources in the state of Texas through TechShare and TextQuest uh, programs. And like I said, we built in some flexibility so that when we hear about something like Bendable, we can maybe we can maybe pivot and do that. Um, so we want to, like I said, stay as nimble as possible and be able to, to respond to opportunities that come up. 
So we're going to continue to move forward with digital inclusion efforts. As you can tell, we're kind of on two tracks, both providing access to content, uh, digital content, but also providing the accessibility to that, the connectivity to that. Um, we are also very interested, like everybody, in those emergency connectivity funds. Um, something like that might open up possibilities, like you were talking about, to bring you know, some other kinds of, of, of service models into the state. Um, we're very interested in, in looking at that. Uh, I'll just say that uh, I just hope that the libraries can participate in that and that all of those funds don't go to K-12. We love our partners in K-12, but the libraries would like a little piece of that money too. So I think we wanna make sure that we can get in there with some good ideas, um, try to compete for some of those funds. Uh, there is also a possibility we might receive some funding from the Texas legislature in the current session to try to address technology assistance in libraries. Uh, in the form of devices and, and technology access, but also uh, to catch up with some price increases for online resources in, in our um, online database programs. Speaking of the Texas legislature, I'll just mention a couple of other policy things that are happening. We have had some good movement in the last two sessions, uh, but we're hoping for, for, for more. Last session, the Texas legislature established, and we were very happy about this, a statewide broadband council operating out of the governor's office. Uh, thanks to advocacy by ourselves and the Texas Library Association, we were able to get a library representative added to that group uh, in statute. And that person is our good friend, Eddie Smith, who's the uh, ED at the Abilene Library Consortium. Absolutely, thumbs up for Eddie. Uh, great guy and very knowledgeable about these topics. Um, so they issued a report and have made some progress. Um, in the current session, we've got a, uh, several bills uh, advancing that address broadband. There are two, there's two omnibus uh, bills, a House and a Senate version uh, that, among other things, would establish a permanent broadband office either strangely in the comptroller's office or more strangely in the uh, University of Texas system office. Uh, so we're watching to see how that plays out. Unfortunately, I'm sorry to report that libraries are not mentioned in that, even though we are the only E-rate eligible entity that's not specifically called out. Uh, once again, we find ourselves having to claw our way to the table, uh, and it's not certain in this case that we'll be able to make it, but, but uh, we are uh, trying to advocate for that. Uh, and meanwhile, we just continue to explore different ways to try to bring resources to folks uh, and especially in ways that go beyond the library. You know, we've had a robust toward gigabit library project uh, that's involved several libraries across the state and, and used Carson Block, whom I'm sure all of you know very well, uh, as a key partner in, in delivering those services. Cindy Fisher, again, on our staff, uh, who's the source of much wonderful work in the area of digital inclusion, designed a website um, in, in consultation with some legal service groups uh, that locates free Wi-Fi across the state of Texas. Uh, you can find that on our website, uh, the Texas Free Wi-Fi map. Um, terrific resource that got a lot of attention from elected officials, legislators, and so forth, as well as in the press. Um, and we, we, we continue to try to push out content as well. We just launched, um, about 18 months ago or so, we launched a uh, a new project uh, called eRead Texas, which is our statewide uh, ebook project, and, and we're bringing those uh, resources to any resident of the state of Texas, whether or not they have a library card or not. And um, we're just uh, trying to push out in as many different ways as we possibly can and uh, address those needs. Um, and I think that's about all I wanted to, to tell you guys. I appreciate the time, I appreciate being invited to share. Um, happy to answer any questions. Wow. <laughs> I mean, what uh, what an inventory of activities. Uh, I mean, that's that's just massive, Mark. I'm I hope, you're, I hope you're looking uh, hope you're reading from notes, uh, not just reeling that off of memory. And our staff are very tired too. So yeah, that's that's why, because they're doing a lot of stuff. So I guess so. Uh, that's a great story about uh, Eddie Smith, who we've had on as a guest here. Uh, yep. and uh, we even played the song Abilene, but then Eddie told us, well, that's Abilene, Kansas. You know, it wasn't actually Abilene, Texas. Anyway, the fact that he that you were able to get a position on the on the uh, state broadband commission task force, whatever you called it, and, and have a librarian on it, that's that's substantial. 
and, and an accomplishment and having a voice there. Every state should have a librarian voice uh, on their broad and every state should have a broadband commission. It's just who who serves broadband to more people than libraries before the well, pandemic, it was one in three people access the Internet at a library. That's 80 million people. You're exactly right, Don. And I think that's one of the things that, that just becomes a little discouraging sometimes is that we we have to keep making this case. I mean, we've been doing this for 25 years, you know, going back to Internet days and, you know, libraries have always been early adopters of technology and right. always, always been the, 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 the hub for technology in the community. But we have to keep making that point every single time. It's like, how many times do we have to push this rock up the hill here? So, but we'll do it however many times we'll do it. However many times. I've tried to make a study of this phenomena, the you know, the libraries taken for granted phenomena. And I have a couple of theories. One is that they do so many things, they're not really identified with a particular thing, like schools. We know what schools do, hospitals, you know, all these institutions, they have a mission that's, pr that's pretty narrowly defined. Libraries, we've started calling them the Swiss Army knife of public institutions. They just, they oh. do so many things. And, and they're, we've, discovered there are like three populations that would be very valuable as allies, but seem to specifically overlook libraries. That would be wealthier people. You know, they just one click, whatever. Uh, technologists tend to wonder why libraries are still around, amazingly. And, and politicians, for some reason, I don't want to say that they lack an appreciation of literature, but they seem to just not quite appreciate the value of libraries have to their communities until people show up at the at the council meeting when they're talking about the budget. But those are valuable constituencies. We've spent most of our time trying to build a bridge to the technology world to understand the value of information scientists to information technologists. It's a natural partnership and a lot across the educational institutions, if I may digress slightly. We've only found uh, three, uh, two groups that actually can have meaningful conversations. And I'm talking about K-12 and, and public libraries and, and, uh, and higher education. And those are the network administrators. They can sit down and say, they you know, talk about lame users, immediately know what they're talking about. The other one, the only other one are librarians. They, school, academic, public librarians can sit down and immediately have meaningful conversations about you know needs and and, and practices uh, and they are the those two are the natural binders across those institutions which have not been integrated or even aligned in their uh, delivery of services and it's it's just absurd that that libraries play such an important role in education and yet have very rarely have formal relationships with educationalists schools and much less universities so that's my little soapbox for the day on that. When you when you when when you have a future session on perceptions of libraries, invite me back because I got a couple of comments on that. All and right. That well, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. We're doing ad hoc here. Hey, that's a whole other hour, Don. We we could get into that. We'll, so we'll do it. We'll do it. I'll, I'll take you up on that because I think it's important. Because one of the things that libraries need is encouragement on how to be more assertive in making their value case. And yeah. It, it's well, hard because there's so many things, but it's valuable. Well, we've, to we've done that, and many libraries have done that. And, and you know, we have a we have an ROI uh, study that we that we promulgated, and a lot of a lot of states and a lot of libraries have done it. I, I think it's just you were just running up against kind of very. We continue to run up against very traditional ideas about what libraries should be, and uh, we find that even among our commission members who are who are pretty well. Uh, aware of what we do and what libraries do, but we it's we always have to kind of go back to square one and say, yeah, you know, yeah, we do books, yeah, we do, you know, we do that, but but we do a whole bunch more nowadays. So we're thinking about doing an assertiveness workshop. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't that wouldn't be too bad either. Although most of the librarians I know are pretty darn assertive, I can tell you. But yeah, well, it depends on the topic, you know. Uh, but you know, mainly they're civil servants. They can't really be political activists. It's a, it's a kind of a handicap, and, yeah. and so they really rely on their communities to play that role for them. And the communities also are, you know, they're kind of perplexed sometimes. Most people don't really understand the range of services that libraries provide. Most people, I would say, easily most people don't appreciate that uh, that scope. 
uh, but they're essential. But I am hopeful that in this pandemic, in this understanding of the necessity for people to have access to all these services, all these public services uh, that, sh you know, you can't, you can't make an appointment to get vaccinated unless you go online. Mm -hmm. So where is that going to happen? So just everything, it, it, there's, you can't apply for a job at McDonald's unless you go online. So this just an, it's become a necessity. And, and that's putting libraries into, I think, a new, a new focal point because when you challenge government people about what about those people that don't have a connection, you've done all this e-gov everywhere, what are they supposed to do? And they go, oh yeah, well, they can go to the library. Well, I think this is sinking in that libraries are in fact essential services and so we're just going to keep beating the drum pushing that rock right along with you so we are on the hour here uh but this is not a tv program so we don't have to close necessarily and we usually hang out for a while afterwards uh i'm going to ask janet if she has uh, a closing remark or two or three um I, I put it in the chat and, you know, inspired by what Mark was talking about and, and you talking about collaborations. Um, you know, the, the university and our collaboration with the university and um, Network Maine, they're the ones that do the RFP. They're the ones that manage the technology. It's their infrastructure and on top of that with network, with the Maine School and Library Network that makes it possible for us in Maine, you know, to have these robust fiber connections to the libraries. And, and so I'm, I'm so appreciative of their vision and their commitment to overall, you know, high speed access for schools and libraries. And, and, and so those collaborations are so important. And it's it's hard to do in some states. I think we're lucky in Maine because it's smaller. But um, you know, I, I think the other thing there's 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 so much to do, <laughs> and there's so much for libraries to do. And uh, our the bendable project and everything that we're we're doing, you know, all comes out of the discussions with the Department of Labor and with Adult Ed and with the university. And it's really hard to keep those discussions ongoing so that you can approach problems together and come up with solutions when money suddenly like ARPA appears. Uh, that, that's, that's a good point. And, and Network Maine is doing a wonderful job up there. And I think they're also part of the same national group with the uh, Texas uh, R&E Network. Uh, uh, the Quilt is the, that national association. And these groups are essential. They first started out connecting the universities. They were the original deployers of the first generation of the internet yeah. to connect the universities. Okay, and then they started connecting colleges and then K-12 and libraries and have really uh, uh, blossomed as per key providers to our, our, our institutions and are now exploring uh, uh, various kinds of wireless uh, doing CBRS systems in Utah and uh, just, you know, they're, they keep expanding and their natural partners and their motivation is a little bit different from a, from a commercial ISP, like a lot different usually. Yeah. Uh, it's the same way that a local provider, a local wireless ISP is usually of a community and has a different kind of motivation to help out in these, uh, this infrastructure development. So there are a lot of ways to go, a lot of things to do and wireless is, you know, has really gotten a lot simpler. I mean, it's it's incredibly complex technology, but deployments uh, and the technology to, to do DIY types of things have gotten much closer to uh, a reality. And and they're quicker and they're cheaper, but they're not as good as fiber. But wireless will pull fiber. If you connect people, they'll start wanting more, and then you can. Uh, uh, identify demand and that can help justify in investment and increase capacity. So don't give up the fiber hope there, Janet, uh, or, or Mark either. I mean, they're a, so Texas is big, <laughs> but uh, 
it, it can be done. It really, it really needs to be done because I don't see how we can be uh, a whole country if we've got so many tens of millions of people just not participating in what is now our our standard platform for interaction, which is digital. So we have to figure out a way to do it. This has been really fascinating. Mark, we're going to give you the very, very last word on the session today, and then we'll close out the recording and, and uh, go into our kind of hangout period. Mark. Oh, I just just uh, thank you for, for letting me participate, and, and thanks to, to uh, the opportunity to listen to Janet talk about um, what they've done in Maine. I, I, my very first COSLA meeting, I, I, I looked I listened to the the then state librarian from Maine talking about the great work that they were doing, and it's just been uh, we've been following you guys all along, and, and appreciate your leadership in in this area, and and what libraries all over the country are doing to 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 make this connectivity happen. And it's a patchwork; it's it's fiber, and it's 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 wireless, and it's it's all of the above. And but we're pushing out some really interesting stuff, and and we will eventually get credit for being on the vanguard of, of connecting uh, communities to broadband. I'm sure that we will, so. Well, you are now. Uh, look, we've, we've been privileged to fund a couple of projects in Texas. One in Pottsboro, which is a partnership with a, a local WISP who's using oh, it's red hot. We had the we had Diane Connery from uh, Pot, Pottsboro speaking to our commission this week, and you know she that that person could talk for two hours about all the projects they're doing, and and really gives the lie to the idea that small community libraries can't do all of the great stuff that that urban libraries can do. So anyway, it's an extraordinary example, and you're right about Diane. Uh, one of the things she probably mentioned was her partnership with the Information Technology Disaster Resource Center. ITDRC.org. They're based in Fort Worth. It's a it's a it's a 2,000 volunteer member organization. Phenomenal, and they do uh, they do disaster response when disaster hits. They come in and help help recover communication, and they will help anybody. You don't have to be in a disaster if you're just looking for a connection. You call them up, and they will connect you. It's just phenomenal itdrc.org. We've been working with them for several years. They're fantastic people. Uh, they get all kinds of equipment and resources donated from big tech companies who don't want to be in the disaster business. Uh, and they vector them through ITDRC to deploy these. And they've got outstanding engineers that are ready to go out anywhere and help people get set up. So call them up. They're, I can't believe they just have an open invitation to anybody to help them do anything, but that's what they say. So and they're doing it. They've, they've connected hundreds of, of, of places over the last year. It's, it's phenomenal. Um, uh, the other place in Texas I, I want to also mention is uh, Castleberry. Uh, Castleberry ISD uh, in Tarrant County, partnering with the local library. In Castleberry, a medium-sized school district, has deployed its own cell system using CBRS and, and uh, the open spectrum in, in uh, the CBRS uh, frequencies to create, in effect, a, you know, a cell system for mobile connectivity. And so uh, they use some of that to partner with the local library to target places where they can support students with fixed access points. And, and that's a, just a natural partnership with a local library. Where, where do students need help? You know, let's figure out how to do it together. So they're great people too. They're just great people all over the all over the place. And you'll find more of them in a library than you will anywhere else. So uh, with that, I think we will close the recording session now. But first, I'd like to ask everybody to unmute. Unmute everybody, if you would. Please unmute. Because if we were at a conference somewhere and we had two excellent speakers like we had today with Mark and Janet, we'd give them a round of applause. And that's what we're gonna do now, please. Everybody give them a hand of applause. Thank you very much. That's great. Okay, well, we'll see you next week. And that concludes this session. Please come back. We've got a really interesting uh, guest next week. We have, uh, we have the incoming president of ALA uh, who's gonna join us next week, uh, Patty Wong. So come back. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs>